Okay, so Julie, I collected uh, some uh, questions uh, from the students. Uh, so I'm now going to call uh, uh, their names and they will ask a question each. Okay, okay. so the first on my list uh, is Annalisa. So Annalisa, can you please unmute to yourself and ask your question? So my question is, what is the most interesting part of your job? <laughs> Annalisa, the problem is, I absolutely love life. I love everything. But the thing I'm addicted to, really addicted, is learning. I just love learning. So anything I do, if I'm learning, then I'm happy. So this morning I was teaching children. <laughs> we were making jelly <laughs> and cream <laughs> at the top of the mountain near Asiago. I don't know if you know where that is. And other times I'm inspecting schools and I learn so much and I just get excited about learning. When we first went into lockdown with COVID, and by the way, my school was the first school in Italy <laughs> to be closed, I thought, oh no, what will I do? And I spent every night learning to do things. I learned to garden, and now I have a wonderful garden. I learned to make macrame, which I still have to give a basket to Palmina. <laughs> yes, um, and I learned to cook, but I also learned, of course, to use Zoom, and I learned to teach cooking to my friends in, in the United Kingdom and other countries too. So for me, the most exciting thing about anything I do is learning. You can't get enough learning. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Annalisa. And uh, I think Lisa uh, is uh, is the next. Lisa, you are yes. with Annalisa, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Here you are, Lisa. Um, so my question is: How does it feel to have an entire school in your hands, and what are the benefits and disadvantages of this work? Well. <sighs> I think that's an incredibly emotional uh, question <laughs> because having a language school and having people who depend on you for their livelihood, um, so people who are employed by you, is a huge, huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. And so it can be absolutely terrifying, especially when we hit COVID or COVID hit us. But there are other things that are just so satisfying to watch people grow and develop and support other people is a really, a really wonderful opportunity. And if you're the owner of the school, you can do this. It's not like working, I don't know, as uh, working in a bank and doing what you're told to do, which is what my husband used to do. It's much more about what I like to do. And what I want to do is see people develop. And they can be students, they can be teachers, they can be colleagues, managers, but that's what I love doing. And the benefits and disadvantages. The disadvantage is definitely um, worry, worry about a colleague who's sick, for example, or finding a teacher to cover a lesson, or uh, do we have enough computers for the next exam? That's worry, definitely. Um, but the advantage and the benefit is definitely watching people grow, being able to take charge of my own destiny, um, being able to have a school that reflects, I have to say my values, my personal values and values that are now shared with my colleagues. 
Our, one of our core values in my school is inclusivity. So we have a whole area in our um, bookcase that is just teaching people to include other people, for example. So it's having your own business means you can make your own choices, but it's also a bit frightening. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. And thanks, Lisa. Maya, over to you. Yes. Hi, Julie. Nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you, Maya. It's a lovely name. <laughs> thank you. So my question is, how was your passion for creating materials for kids born? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> goodness. Well, I think... First of all, you have to know that my first degree was in jewellery, silversmithing and design. And my other passion is cooking. Now you might think that neither of those has anything to do with teaching. But to me, teaching is creative. When I learned to cook at school, I had a very strict teacher and I didn't like her at all. I still don't like her, but I learned a lot. I learned how to manage time really efficiently, how to plan, how to keep things in order and keep them tidy and clean. She was very strict and she would give us tasks. For example, I still remember this and it's a long time ago, <laughs> she said, you have to plan a meal, a celebration meal for four people aged 55, and one of them has a heart problem. And you have to cook a starter, a main meal, and a dessert. And you have to do all of this and clean up and serve everything on time in two hours. Then she invited other teachers to come and eat the meal. So it made me learn to respect deadlines, to plan well, to manage my time well, and to keep organized and tidy. In fact, at school, in this school where I am now, I'm a little bit OCD. I like everything to be lined up and perfect. Maybe afterwards I'll show you around. And so I'm a little bit, I'm not very good at school, but when I'm at home, I'm more relaxed. So that was definitely something. And then learning jewelry, silversmithing and design, and that's very creative. Um, that was very important to me. And I won a cookery competition and I also won a jewellery, silversmithing and design competition. And my children, who are older than you, say to me, didn't you waste your time? And the answer is no. Your time is never wasted if you're learning, as long as you know how to transfer your skills. And I hope, I would like to think, that I bring into teaching that creativity and passion for what I do. I can say, Julie, that you do. Okay, so I, I, I can confirm. Okay. Uh, Julie is a very passionate lady and everything she does, she puts so much passion in it that you just love what she says and what she does. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Okay, next question is from uh, Julia Pulisi. We have quite a few Julias uh, around, so yeah. Julia Pulisi. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, it's me. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, what inspires you while writing material for kids? Well, kids, I think. I have to show you something. One moment. You get from children what you give. So this is what I got today. I don't know if you can see. It says, and they all made my name. It's completely wrong, G-I-U-L-Y, but never mind. I think 
kids inspire you. Um, I've noticed that some people get very angry with kids and I'm not sure why they're in the classroom, why they teach, because if you can see the best in children, they will give you the best. And that's the same for teenagers. By the way, I prefer teaching teenagers. So people like you, because you're beginning to think a lot more. And it's the same for adults. The more you give, the more you get back. And when you finish school, perhaps you'll go to university or do an Erasmus, maybe travel. Remember that the more you give, the more you will get back wherever you go and whatever you do in life. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Julia, for your question and Julie for your answer. Alice, you are the next. Where is Alice? Alice. Alice? Yes, yes, I was having okay. problems. <laughs> okay, <laughs> with the microphone. The microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so is participating to co conferences all over Europe in interesting for you? Mainly because it's all over Europe. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, look, the, until lockdown, I don't think I ever spent more than two weeks in my home. So you can imagine what a shock it was for me to learn to stay at home. Um, and in the last eight weeks, I've been to uh, Gdańsk in Poland, and I've been to Bucharest, and my next, uh, I'm going to uh, Sardinia soon, and at the end of May, I'm going to Turkey. All of these places are interesting because every single time you learn something new. And that's the same at a conference and the same when I'm an inspector. Even if I'm just visiting a school, okay, like Palmina's lovely school, you learn something every single time, every single time. One of my colleagues, who's currently the president of Isley, asked me once, what did you learn from the school we just visited? And I said, I don't know yet. I need to reflect, but I will tell you in a week. And in one week's time, I did. Even if you learn something about yourself, just going outside your comfort zone and visiting people and talking to people will give you new ideas and make you think and reflect about the way you work and the way you behave. Um, so, I had um, an additional question, yes. if that's possible. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes, go ahead, Alicia. Um, before, um, you mentioned that um, something about Ethiopia. Have you been physically to Ethiopia or um, virtually? Unfortunately, uh, no, I, not unfortunately for Ethiopia. Unfortunately, the last one I wanted to go to, I had to do virtually, and that was teaching and training teachers in Tunisia. Ethiopia was a wonderful project, which Palmina would have been absolutely the best colleague I could have had with me, because it was about coaching, and it was about coaching not just teachers, it was a remarkable project because the government brought teachers and head teachers and supervisors from all over the country. Every school had three people, a head teacher, a supervisor that watched the teachers teach and gave feedback and a teacher. And we spent weeks training them to coach and help each other. There were two two-week cycles, so I was there for a month. And um, in each section, there were about 550 people. So it was uh, a really special moment. I was interested because I lived in Ethiopia for three years. That's why. So, Where, I... did, you live, hmm? Where did you live? 
Um, I lived in Addis Ababa. Okay. So, yeah. Did you go to an Italian school there, Alice? No, my friend did. I went to an American international school, ICS. Oh. Hence the accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Alice. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Stefania, your question. Hi, Julie. It's a pleasure talking with you. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the question I wanted to ask you is, how are teachers are able to collaborate? In my school? Or, yeah. or school with you? In your school. Oh, goodness, yes. Um, I think teachers join schools like mine and like Palmina's because they have opportunities to collaborate. I think... Um, it's unusual in a language school, but the association we belong to, Isley, um, insists that we help teachers develop. So most people who want to work for, for our schools come because they know they're going to get support, they're going to work together, and they're going to collaborate. And we do that by meeting every Monday, we, uh, we work on projects like you, and we bring back and share what we've learned constantly, and we teach each other. We do gallery walks where we make posters of the things we've done and invite our colleagues to walk through our gallery and explain what we're doing. We have coffee mornings in lockdown. We had aperitifs online. <laughs> and shared our concerns and the things we were good at. We try and help and support each other all the time. Does that answer your question, Stefania? Thank you. Would you like to come and work here? <laughs> yeah. Good, I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you in contact. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Stefania. Martina. Martina, you were trying to unmute yourself before. Problems with the microphone, Martina? Okay, let, um, we move to the next question and we go back to Martina. I think she has some problems with uh, the connection or the microphone. Okay, Sofia. Okay, hi, Ms. Wallace. It's so nice to meet you. And my questions are, uh, how do you self-evaluate uh, your teaching strategies? And what's the difference between uh, success and failure when you're working with a, a child? The second question is really hard. I'm going to leave that to last. Self-evaluate is quite easy. It's not just about self-evaluating. It's about taking time to reflect. I think, I personally think one of the biggest problems these days is people don't take time or make time to reflect. So um, as a teacher, when I'm teaching, I have time to think through what I've done and whether I succeeded in meeting my aims. And I'll know that by asking those why questions as I go along and checking that the learners have understood and are able to do the final task, especially if I'm going easy to difficult. So it's not terribly hard to work out if you did something right or wrong. What's harder, I think, is to find the humility to, to accept you've made a mistake. Um, and sometimes my lessons are not brilliant. They bomb, we say in English. And uh, sometimes I say to the students, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't a very good lesson. But it's not very often. And because it's not very often, they forgive me. But generally, I have time to sit back and think about what I've done and how it, how it went. But more than anything, did I achieve my aims and did the learners achieve 
the learning outcome aims. And the second question, <laughs> Sophia, do you want to ask me the question again? Ah, uh, yes, sure. Uh, what's the difference between success and failure when you're working with a child? Okay, and I was playing for time there. Goodness. And I, and the reason I'm playing for time, I don't really know. I don't think, I think it's like being a parent. You never really know if you're doing the right thing, but you never give up because you love them. And I think that's the same with children, teenagers. Over the last two years, the thing I've noticed most is parents are stressed, of course, because of COVID, maybe they don't have jobs, it's difficult. Teachers are stressed because in state schools in particular, I can see Vincenzo's here and Conchita's here, so they might agree, but teachers are stressed because they're expected to do more and they're trying to cope in a virtual world, which they haven't been trained to work in, or most of them haven't been. And that's very hard for them. So they're stressed too. Kids, especially at the Scuola Media, and maybe the first or second or third class in the high school, are having panic attacks. And they're suffering because of the stress of the people around them. And nobody's listening anymore. They're all, we're all so busy and so worried that we've stopped listening. For me, when a kid says to me, a kid who maybe isn't very good at English, the lesson's finished, it's three o'clock, and they say, Julie, can we stay longer? Can we keep going? That's success, because you know that they're interested even if it's just to listen to them, which is what happened last year, a group of students said, can we stay and just talk because nobody listens to us anymore? The other thing, I, I don't know if Vincenzo and Conchita have noticed too, these kids having, and maybe, I hope not you, you guys, <laughs> but anxiety attacks and a lack of self-esteem, I'm stupid, I'm fat, I'm... And for me, it's more important to help those kids find their self-esteem and confidence than it is to learn to say hello in English. Because if I don't help them there, they're never going to learn. This is absolutely true, Julie. This is true. We have to... Uh, to focus more on their personality, more on uh, their well-being rather than uh, just content. Uh, okay, so yes, thank you. This was very important. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Sofia. Okay, uh, Dori Lisa. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Julie. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. My question is, uh, why did you choose to create activities for an audience of minors? First of all, Dorelisa, thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> and um, I haven't only chosen to work on materials for minors. Most of the materials I work on are for teachers to teach with. And my main subject is CLIL. So I have spent quite some time teaching teachers in Spain and in France to create their own materials for CLIL, and I've had to, in turn, create materials for them. Um, the, reason, <laughs> the reason I started to produce materials for children was because I think it was Palmina who asked me to, um, and that was for the magazine um, in, uh, English 24, where Isley produced materials for families. And we couldn't find a materials writer for children aged 11 and 12. And so I did it. And it was a bit 
I think I went through all the processes that I've explained to you today. First of all, I didn't know who the children would be. So I had to ask my children and their friends what they would like to know about. And eventually my section was called Josh's Heroes and Josh was a friend my son was staying with. And we chose people that their schools wanted them to learn about, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and so on. But we also chose people that were a little bit different. And I worked with a colleague and a fantastic artist to draw pictures. And I also had the idea that if you want to engage children, they need to play games. So I always found links to games they could play to learn better. Now, of course, everybody talks about gamification, but then nobody was really doing it. Um, I enjoy it. <laughs> yes, I can remember those times, uh, the English 24 times. Uh, when we did it, good I memories. remember Palmina calling me often and I was on holiday on a canal boat in England, sitting, <laughs> writing materials on holiday. Yes, I can remember. Uh, Erika, we have your last question. Hi, nice to meet you. Hello. My question is how we can keep children entertained? How can we keep children entertained? I think, again, going back to what I said earlier, Erica, is um, the challenge shouldn't be too difficult, but not too easy. That might mean differentiated learning or different, different, different roles or different tasks for different students or different support for different students. But I think you have to, when I said humility, I'll give you an example of a, a terza media last year. Very quiet, very introverted and very small class. Nine children in a small village up the mountain. Okay. And I went in, the teacher said, will you teach them? I don't even remember what it was. And I went in and I made a fantastic PowerPoint and I took lots of interesting things. Uh, from my travels. It must have been present perfect simple. It always is. Have you ever been to Africa? Have you ever been to? And they were absolutely flat. That was the look. It's terrible being a teacher looking at blank faces when you've put so much effort into doing something special. And at the end of the class, I have to admit, I was a little bit cross, but then I had to reflect and ask myself, who, whose fault is it? Who is responsible for making it interesting? Me, what did I forget to do? I forgot to ask them. So I went back into the classroom and I said to them, was I boring you? And they were so shocked <laughs> and they looked at me. And one boy said, are you serious? <laughs> and I said, absolutely. I need to know because I'm coming next week and I don't want to bore you because it, it's not good for me too. I want to leave the room happy. So if I was boring you, you need to tell me what will interest you. Surprisingly, really surprisingly, this group of nine students decided they wanted to present using PowerPoint, their little village and a cave up in the mountain and the history and the geography in English to me. And the next few weeks they spent doing that. 
And when we finished school, the same little group of children took me and five other teachers on a two hour, I'd like to say walking trip, but it was terrifying at times, around the mountain to see the cave. So by the end, I was successful, but I had to stop and reflect and say, who is responsible for making it motivating? And go back and ask them, what can I do that will make it interesting for you? Thank you. And we will keep this in mind uh, when uh, we will create uh, our materials uh, for our kids uh, for the exhibition. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Okay, do we have, uh, are there more questions? Does anyone want to ask uh, something else to Julie? I think you have somebody who couldn't- Martin, Yes, mind. Martina, but maybe Martina has, le uh, uh, has left. Martina. I'm here, I'm sorry. Oh, Martina, you're here. I have a problem to access. Um, okay. My question is, uh, okay. uh, uh, what kind of, um, of activities are the most appealing to children? I think anything where they can move, for sure. Um, even simple activities like uh, music and, and using their hands. Last week I was asked to work, I, I presume you also had flash mobs in Sicily. On Friday at 11 o'clock, there were flash mobs for peace all across the country. And so I was asked to work on something with primary school children to do with peace. And we sang a song, but the whole thing was done to movement. So um, TPR, I'll write in the chat for you. TPR is total physical response activities where they're physically moving and learning because of actions are always interesting. Children, I'd say under the 11 and under, never sing with teenagers at age 13. That's the age I call the smelly age and they don't sing in front of each other. <laughs> so recognizing what they're comfortable with and at different ages is important. Okay, thank you, Julie. Thanks, Martina. Okay, do we have other questions? Julia, yes. Mm. Hi, okay. Julia. Hi, Julie. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I had a question for you. Uh, what has been uh, your favorite experience and why? <laughs> as a teacher or as a person? Um, person. Oh, goodness me. That one I wasn't expecting. I think the experience I will always carry with me was being in a mountain hut made of cow poo and mud at the top of the Sami Pass in Lesotho in South Africa, eating in the pitch black with just one candle, but you couldn't see anything, not knowing what you were eating. And then I walked out, I'm still going cold. I walked out of the door of the hut and the stars were so bright, you could pick them off the sky, they were so beautiful. And as I looked up, a shooting star went across the sky. Probably that's the best moment ever. My children were with me too, and my Thanks. husband. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for coming uh, uh, um, yes, Well, you. may I say something? Yes, yes absolutely. Okay, yes. first of all, I'd like to, to um, introduce myself to Julie. Uh, thanks uh, very much for participating, for giving us this great contribution to, uh, above all, to our students. Uh, and so 
I'm really happy because you are so involving. So it, it's really, and I'm sure that you have given a lot of tips to our students. And I have a question too. Uh, well, uh, in the latest lectures, uh, I um, heard that, uh, well, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, focus on a perfect uh, pronunciation uh, when we're teaching English. Uh, but yes, that's sure that uh, um, uh, everybody maintains uh, um, his or her own, uh, um, well, characteristic according to the language. But I keep on working on pronunciation using the um, phonemic system. So my students uh, know that uh, I, I really think that it's very important uh, to, to learn a very good pronunciation, trying to, to, to do uh, their best and acquire a good pronunciation. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's wonderful that you're working on pronunciation. I think uh, pronunciation is important. And the main thing is to teach pronunciation as a chunk rather than one single word. I think quite often people forget that. Uh, so I can read, for example, Julia's message in the chat. I'm sorry, Miss Julie, but I have to go. If I were teaching that, I'd say, listen and repeat, have to go, have to go, I have to go, but I have to go, and so on. So I back chain. I don't think it's wrong to teach pronunciation. What I do think is uh, it's a shame to lose that little bit of you. So if I were to speak to you in Italian, you would know immediately that I'm English and probably you'd know that I live in Veneto too because I still have an accent after 35 years. Quindi se io parlo italiano, lo senti subito che non sono italiano. Italiana, italiano. Okay, so, but I think that's nice. I think that's, it's quite nice that people are slightly different. I like to hear uh, different accents. Um, in England, we even had an actor who was so famous for his French accent that he was banned because he was too sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Just because of his voice. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, guys, we are at the end of our session today. So we thank Julie. Julie, thank you so much. It was so inspiring uh, and so many ideas. Uh, so next Monday, we will be ready to start uh, with our projects, uh, uh, following your suggestions uh, and uh, your tips. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you for being with us today.